Hi folks, it's Karen Gilbert from Online Perfume School and welcome to another student showcase. I'm here today with Katrina from Jewels and Vetiver. Hi Katrina and thank you so much for agreeing to join us. Um, Katrina's going to just share a little bit about her journey and um, tell us a little bit more about her brand as well because it's very new. You just started, so you launched in um, 2017, right? Is that... 2018 actually 2018. sometimes the journey feels a little bit longer than I yeah. realized okay fabulous so um welcome Katrina just can we just start by you know letting everybody know like your brand you know your where to find you so for those of you who want to follow Katrina and her journey and, and take a look at her brand um she's got a gorgeous Instagram page so if you could just give us a little bit of a I will post the links below the the um the video as well so just if you could just give us a little bit of a guide to where to find you online yeah you can find us uh, Twitter on on Instagram uh, Jules and vetiver all spelled out one word um, and on Jules and as well fab so Katrina tell us a little bit about um, you know Jules and vetiver and you know what your ethos is and you know how you got into it all really how you got started yeah, it's funny. I actually, uh, I came from the corporate world. I knew that I wanted to launch my own business. I was always super interested in fragrance. I just didn't know a whole lot about it. I think that's the case probably for a lot of people. I think a lot of us, you know, most of us are using fragrance in some way, either home fragrance or personal fragrance. I just think that the way the perfume world has traditionally been, we, most of us don't know a whole lot about it. So I knew that I wanted to kind of explore it as a business. I realized the fact that I didn't know a whole lot about it actually was a bit of a business opportunity because realizing that probably a lot of people were in the same position as, as me, where it was kind of this interesting, creative, olfactory world, but no one knew a whole lot about it. I thought maybe if there was a brand out there that was very transparent about ingredients, that, that put an emphasis on education, rather than just selling product, but instead actually try to bring people into this interesting world and educate them and, and have them become more interested in the products. By doing so, I kind of thought like, well, I'm learning so much over time. I'm sure a lot of other people would love to learn the same way too. I mean, I don't think my experience has been unique in the sense that I've unfolded as a perfume nerd. And I think there's a lot of potential for other people out there to become perfume nerds as well. So you know, I probably like some indie perfumers started out with very little knowledge. Um, mm. And that's actually how I had come across your course, because I knew the only way I could explore this business further would be if I obviously learned a whole lot about fragrance. And there aren't a whole lot of options for someone who's who's in a startup position. Obviously, there are some summer schools, all the, you know, the classic, you know, the French schools, they do offer summer courses, but that's not necessarily a, a great option. It's a massive investment. Mm -hmm. um, if you just think that you want to experiment and explore the idea of doing something with fragrance and plus they're only offered, you know, for a select few people, um, yeah. only one certain time of year. I happened to be exploring all of this, um, in the spring and I thought, I don't want to wait that long. <laughs> so when I came across your course, I thought, well, this is kind of perfect because this is a great way to get an introduction into the world of perfumery to get familiar with the material, learn about the basics. And if at that point in time, I really feel compelled to be doing more, um, this at mm -hmm. least gives me a really good foundation to start with. And there are a lot of materials out there, I think that, you know, a lot of YouTube videos and other things that if you want to be a self-taught perfumer, there's a lot of information out there online, but none of it is really structured. Um, mm -hmm. None of it is really organized in any way. It's not, it's not a curriculum. And I, I think that's what really drew me to your course because I knew that it was coming from someone experienced. I knew that it was structured. Um, it forced me to pace myself because, you know, the modules were only released every couple of weeks, which I remember at times finding a little bit frustrating because I, I was so eager to keep going. But I realized that that was a really good way for me to be, be learning stuff kind of academically and then be forced to go and mix and slow Absolutely. down and absorb all of it. It was, it was fantastic in that respect. So yeah. So, you know, and that was about a year ago, actually, that, that yeah, I took it. So that's, so, really, that's yeah. brilliant that you say that because I do get quite a few people saying, oh, but I want all the modules at once. And the thing is, that's, that's all for well and good. But, you know, I've said this before that it's all very well to watch the video, but unless you actually roll up your sleeves and do the practice, 
you're not going to move forward and you're not going to get where you want to be. And I, I kind of tussled with it for a long time, actually. And I thought, no, you know what? I'm going to, no matter how many times people beg me to release the modules more quickly, I've paced it specifically to give people enough time to do the work as well as watch the videos. And so people are not going to binge watch and then just think, oh, well, I haven't got where I want to be because they actually haven't done the work. So I'm glad you flagged that up because I, I think that's some, one of the things that, you know, people, we, we kind of forget. And, you know, I, I'm as guilty as the next person with any, you know, with anything. We kind of think, okay, well, we'll dig into the content and then we don't get around to doing the practical and it doesn't move us forward. So that's brilliant that you did that. Um, and so tell me a little bit about where your inspiration came from with Jules and Vetiver as a brand, actually, because everybody's got a, like, a different path, a different reason for wanting to start a fragrance brand. And I love your, um, I follow you on Instagram and I love your blog posts and your little educational snippets. I love that. So what was the sort of inspiration behind the, the brand apart from the education side? So where the fragrance ideas came from? Yeah, I mean, I, I knew pretty much up front that, that I didn't necessarily want to make the, the focus on, on all naturals because mm -hmm. um, I thought that that would kind of limit the ingredient palette that, that I would be working with creatively. Um, and obviously learning a lot about ingredients, I thought it would kind of open, open, up, open up the quality, open up the consistency um, if I was using both man-made and, and botanical ingredients. So I kind of knew that up front. I also thought that you know, there are a lot of fragrance brands that don't really offer any transparency. And I thought that that also kind of tied in with the, the emphasis on education for the brand, because, mm. you know, you don't necessarily know what you do or don't like as far as scent until, <clears throat> excuse me, you don't necessarily know what you do or don't like when it comes to scent until you start learning ingredients. And I thought, you know, if, if you were eating a dish in a fine restaurant and, and they didn't really tell you anything that was in it, or they really said, well, you're, you're eating, you're eating a, a dish of spaghetti and there's some tomato in there. Well, beyond tomato, how would you ever learn which spices you like? They need to tell you, oh, well, there's oregano and there's basil and there's garlic so that you can learn over time. Oh, okay. I didn't realize this, but, but I like garlic. I like it quite a bit. I can use it in other dishes and that sort of thing. You know, so it's sort of an analogy, I think, for fragrance. I, I sort of thought the more people can see, you know, I didn't see any reason to be secretive um, mm -hmm. ab about ingredients. I decided I'm going to list everything that's in there. You can decide what you do or don't like. If there are ingredients there that you've, that you've researched that, that make you uncomfortable for whatever reason, or, or you prefer to stick with all naturals, that's fine. But this is all of it learn it, see how you feel about it. And, and you know, it's kind of all out there. So I, I just wanted to make sure that that people kind of knew what they were getting, felt empowered, felt engaged and involved. So even just the ingredient transparency, I think ties into the educational aspect because I want people, I want people to, to learn. And I think the more that they learn about themselves and what they do or don't like, you know, the, the, the more enlightened of a, of a customer that they're going to be. So, um, mm -hmm. You know, in terms of how the brand was was formed, you know, I knew also in the beginning that I wanted it to be a unisex fragrance. Mm -hmm. um, so the name was kind of deliberate in that sense. So in terms of the the brand name, I knew in the beginning that I wanted this to be a unisex fragrance brand because that's kind of what perfumery was originally about before a lot of the the marketing and the preconceived notions about what's what's you know feminine, what's masculine. That was the heart of perfumery back in the day people just mixed what smelled beautiful and people wore what smelled beautiful and they, they didn't worry about, Oh, does, is this for a man or is this for a woman? So I knew I kind of wanted to bring it back to the original spirit of perfumery in that sense. Um, so when I picked the name, um, I've just always liked the name Jules. And uh, it's funny when, when I had my daughter a couple of years ago, I actually really wanted to name her Julia because I liked the idea of Jules as a nickname. Um, and it's funny, you know, even just the initial round of learning about ingredients, um, you know, you had, you had suggested a, a list of, of um, botanical ingredients for us to kind of learn and, and start getting familiar. And I remember vetiver was the first thing that I smelled that I kind of said, wow, like here's, here's an ingredient that I didn't, I've literally never heard of before. That's how inexperienced I, I was at that point. <laughs> um, and I just loved saying it. I know that sounds really <laughs> odd, but I thought like, here's this incredible smelling thing that I keep coming back to. And it's just, every time I open this bottle, it's, it's a delight. 
and I just really enjoy saying it, you know, like Jules. And, and, and at some point in time, I just sort of thought like, you know, that's, that would, you know, it, it, it's a name that, that I think underscores the fact that I want this to be, you know, unisex, that, that I want the emphasis to be on the ingredients. Mm -hmm. And with vetiver being one of my favorites, it just sort of made sense. Yeah, and I think it's an interesting name as well because it's because you've got like it's not like it's two ingredients, it's a name and an ingredient. And it really I think that kind of um induces a little bit of curiosity. It's like, oh that's that's unusual. Where did that come from? Mm -hmm. Um and there's a lot of you know, you can add story to that. So yeah, fabulous. So um, what would you say, and I'm sure, you know, uh, in any journey that there have been many along the way, what would you say your main challenges have been in your, in your fragrance journey? Oh, wow. I mean, those are numerous. Those, <laughs> those change from week to week. And if, if anyone is, is considering launching their own business, I, I guess I would say, you know, be prepared for the roller coaster in that regard. Yeah. But, you know, th there are a lot of challenges. I, I think certainly in the beginning, I felt like I had learned so much from, from your course and from being able to interact with people. So in terms of formulation, I felt like I learned a great deal. For me, one of the biggest challenges early on was, was packaging. I think when you're a very mm -hmm. small operation, yeah. finding, finding places that, you know, that you can find bottles and, and boxes and, and other packaging, uh, the other elements that are necessary to go to market, that actually took a lot of time, a lot yeah. of trial and error, a lot of, you know, like coming up with design and iterating all of that. Like, I wish I had known going into it that I really needed to budget a fair amount of time for that. I remember finding that kind of frustrating in the beginning. And I think certainly the, the, the Facebook group that, that comes along with the course was also really helpful though, too, because you realize that a lot of your, your fragrance compatriots are, are in the same boat in some ways. Some of them are further yeah. along in their journey as well. So they're able to, you know, provide ideas, suggested vendors, if nothing else, sometimes just echo the fact that they've faced a lot of the same challenges yeah, as well. Absolutely. And so, that always makes you feel better because as a solopreneur, especially, you, you know, it can feel very frustrating and very isolating in the beginning. You sort of feel like, I must be the only person on earth who can't find someone who's able to do beautiful boxes in very small quantities. And, yeah. and I think sometimes, and, and you've pointed this out as well, it's important to kind of stick to your guns in the beginning in terms of what you want to do. It's, it's easy to kind of lose sight of things and say, listen, well, I mean, if I want to do boxes, then I, I have no choice but to start off with, you know, a, a start run of, let's say, a thousand bottles of something, even though that's not what I wanted to do. And that's not yeah. part of the brand mission to do things on that scale. And I think you've pointed out before, you know, start small, be, especially in the beginning, be willing to start as small as is necessary, because in the beginning, you are defining your target customer, you yeah. are defining their tastes, you're really just testing theories. So you're going to fail a little, you're going to have to pivot. and and you know, it's more important to kind of stick to the original vision and, and, and use your smallness as an asset, as an advantage, rather than get carried away and say, well, I want to be a big operation. I guess I have no choice but to be committing the large quantities of things. So the, the group is very helpful, I think, sometimes in, in sanity checking you and yeah. reminding you that there are other people that are experiencing the same issues in their journey. And it's just very helpful to kind of troubleshoot and get through, you know, some of some of the obstacles that come up along the way. Yeah, that's great that you've done that as well. And so when you launched, you did you launched just with one fragrance, right? Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. So, it, so so our first fragrance is a limited yeah. edition scent, and and it's funny, a lot of that was your suggestion as well. Just knowing that I wanted for that one finished fragrance, I really wanted to kind of put it out there and gather the feedback. Like I know that I want the brand to be very iterative. You know, I don't want to be. I'm not doing this for myself. I'm not, I'm not going out there and, and selling perfume to people because, you know, this is my creative vision. If you don't love it, go away. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, obviously my, you know, my, my creativity and my tastes are going to be a factor, but I want to engage my customers. I want them to like it. I want them to feel, you know, unlike a lot of the other big brands, they can feel like, you know, we're all part of this together. It's iterative. We provide feedback and the next limited edition scent is going to be based directly on that feedback. Like they get to feel involved. That's fab, yeah. you know, it's, it's not, it's not bespoke, but they get to feel like, like they're involved in that, in that creative process. And you can really only do that if you're doing very small batches. Yeah. And I love that you've done that actually, because I think there is this kind of belief amongst people starting out that they have to have all of their ducks in a row. They have to have a complete line of fragrances that are 
in the perfect packaging and the branding is spot on and it's all, you know, everything is perfect before they present it to the world. And actually that is one of the biggest um, ways I would say to lose money in this business because you just don't know, like, you know, you sink a whole load of cash into something and you might need to change it. And so what you've done with launching with just one fragrance and having using that sort of customer feedback for, for your development of your brand, I think that is a really great, um, you know, I think it's quite inspiring for others to see and know that they can do that too, because, you know, that's not something that we really see a lot of people doing in the fragrance industry. And I love that. Yeah. You, it's, it's, it's a little bit, of, there's some friction there, I think, because you don't want to feel like you're being hasty and you're yeah. going to market with something that's half baked and, and that you haven't thought it through. But on the other hand, I knew myself, I, I know I'm, I know I'm a perfectionist. I cared very much about not going to market with something that didn't look professional, that didn't yeah. look fully fleshed out, that, that looked kind yeah. of like, I mean, I think it takes a, a certain level of confidence to stick to your guns and say, yeah, we're launching with one thing, one yeah. thing only, because I, I've had many retailers even ask like, okay, well, what are some of your other products? And you have to say, there aren't any, this is, this is it right now. Yeah. Um, because it is, it is unusual, but it's, but that's the, that's the way that you have to start. I knew that if I, if I was obsessed with this notion of getting it perfect and you know, you do a, a little bit of market research, obviously, to start. You want to get people's feedback on the scent and, and some other things. You don't just sort of throw something completely at the wall and hope that it sticks. But I knew that if I, I knew that I could overanalyze myself to death in the, in the concept stages. Yeah. And that if I waited until I had half a dozen products, until I waited, you know, long enough until it, it felt finished, that it felt presentable, <laughs> that it would take years. And so you realize you kind of come to a fork in the road, like, do I want to get out there and start getting feedback, iterating based on feedback? Like, is it good enough to go out with this one product? Or am I going to drive myself nuts, like, and chase my tail for years and come out with something? But you realize at the end of the day, you're putting one thing in front of people to react to, or you're putting out six things for people to react to. But the end result is they're going to be, you know, it's an experiment either way. So it's, you know, do you want to get to that point faster or do you want to get to that point slower? Yeah, absolutely. That's fabulous. Because many people kind of think that, oh, they have to have that perfect. And it is so much slower. Um, and that's why, I, you know, looking at you, the speed of your journey has been amazing. And I think it was quite inspiring for people. I mentioned you on a webinar that I did the other day. And people were like, oh, my God, that's amazing. I didn't realize, you know, you could do it that quickly. Um, it's so funny that, that it seems quick because I remember at the time feeling like it took forever. And <laughs> actually, you people, well, yeah, and a few people have said, well, oh, my God, you know, that, that has really um, made me think that I've just been kind of like twirling around for the last like four years, like trying to tweak this and tweak that without putting something out there. And then, you know, Katrina's gone and like, done that really really you know quickly okay it doesn't feel fast to you but in terms of product development and time scales for launching something new especially from you know a cold start of not really knowing that much about how it all works you know that is quite quick in terms of you know what other people do so amazing well done for that okay. um so yeah i think a lot of the questions that i was going to ask you you've probably covered actually um, but one of the things about, um, just about the course, you know, you said why you decided to, to join it. What would you say, like, so for people who are thinking, oh, you know, I'm not sure if this is right for me, you know, what, what should I do? Is there anything that was like a main kind of like key takeaway for you that, that helped you the most, I would say? Maybe, yeah, I'd say one thing that certainly surprised me about the course, I think going into it, I assumed, okay, well, I'll, I'll learn a fair amount about perfumery. Um, kind of for, from an academic standpoint, I'll learn a lot about ingredients. I'll, I'll, I'll learn composition, maybe a little bit of history as well. I think what pleasantly surprised me and really made me feel like I got more value out of the course than I even realized is the fact that there really is a strong business component to it. Um, you're not just sort of learning, you know, learning about the colorful history of perfumery in the Western world and here's what <laughs> Neroli smells like. And, you know, it's, it's, it, it goes far beyond that. So I think for someone who's actually thinking of, of launching a business, there's a lot in the way of, of resources, I think, available to you in terms of 
you know, figuring out branding, figuring out pricing. You know, I, I know a lot of this stuff is also covered in, in some of your other materials as well, but I think mm -hmm. I was very impressed to see like, no, even just the actual business aspect of this is, is being covered. And again, just being able to interact with, you know, with fellow people in the course yeah. and ask them questions. I mean, I mean, that has been extremely valuable. And I certainly, I don't think going into it, I realized how much of the, the material would be substantive from a business point of view as well. Yeah, and actually, um, I don't know that when I created the course that that was necessarily intentional. But I think as I've, as it sort of developed, and I think the Facebook group um, forms a massive part of that because it means that I can like answer people's questions that are not necessarily in the content. Um, and then we can do extra bits and pieces on the Q and A's that aren't necessarily in the content. And then obviously people get the recordings or the recordings on those as well. So yeah, that's brilliant. So, um, so where's next for Jules and Vetiver then? It's a What's great question. Thing? Yeah. You know, we're starting to branch out more in, in events and that sort of thing. And I think that's going to be exciting too, because when you're a, uh, when you're an online business and you're, and you're starting out and you're selling, you know, a little here, a little there. Um, one of the things you struggle with is just getting a lot of good data, a, lo a lot of the yeah. customer feedback. And, and that's so important. I think, especially when the goal of your first limited edition is to try and gather as much information as possible, what people do or don't like about the scent, the packaging, the brand, really everything. So I think events are going to be really exciting because, you know, I sort of view them as like focus groups almost to just even be able yeah. to interact with people and get that information. Um, we are very much experimenting with, with doing more in the way of bespoke or semi-bespoke sense because um, that's, it's funny, in a way that's always been the spirit of Jules and Vetiver, I think too, you know, not just necessarily wanting to put out, you know, good quality fragrance and, and transparency and education, have that be part of the brand, but also I think part of what's going to engage people and get them really, really excited about scent is being able to feel like they've got some, some creative control over oh what it is God. that they wear. So being able to perfect that process and, and figure out how to, how to offer a bespoke offering via the web, I think that's, that's kind of challenging and, and yeah. be able to offer it hopefully at some point at scale, that's kind of the, the new frontier. So we're going to continue offering, um, you know, finished fragrance, but really bespoke, I think, is, is, is kind of the, the next area that, that I'm hoping to perfect. That's fab. So when you're, so events that you're going to be doing, so um, sort of live kind of, um, going to where, you know where customers can interact with the fragrances and smell them that kind of thing yep. and look at the, the materials and, and what have you yeah partnering with local retailers and pop-up shops and stuff like that that's yeah. certainly for someone who's starting off a brand and we're just like it's such a new brand at this point too I think I think being able to be out there among the people because I mean you know sometimes you're locked in a room and you're mixing things and and you don't have that interaction with your customers quite as much and I know certainly when I sell things online you know we solicit feedback from people but you know it's an email you don't always get the information so being able to kind of just be you know out there among the people and and, and getting that information I think is just really I just think it's very valuable really for a brand at any stage of the life cycle but yeah. but especially when you're this new yeah, and I think that is one of the challenging things about fragrance and selling fragrance online is that, you know, and I've seen brands do things in different ways where they've, um, you know, I saw something recently where there was an ad for a new brand and they were selling a bottle of fragrance, but they were actually giving a, a sample with it and then they would post that and you could try the sample and if you didn't like it, you could just send the bottle back without you know, opening it and what have you. And then there have been, you know, obviously people who do pop-ups and, you know, the, a variety of different means of getting people to be able to test their fragrances. But yeah, it's one of those ongoing challenges of, you know, how we do business now online and fragrance is such a, you know, it's such a tactile, you know, engaged thing that you really have to touch and feel and smell it. So pop-ups are, you know, they're amazing for that. Um, and retailers in your sort of local area. So yeah, that's amazing, brilliant. And also like, you know, you've done, I follow, following your Instagram channel, you're really great on that as well and making that quite interactive. So have you found that you've got um, a lot of interaction from places like Instagram? Yeah, certainly a lot of our customers end up coming from Instagram, which is, which is interesting. It's so great to kind of have that data and, and you know, you can pull that data from Instagram. You can obviously infer a lot on yeah. your site through places like Google Analytics and, and elsewhere too. 
I think, you know, that's very much an important aspect of the business that you kind of need to carve out time for figuring out where your customers are coming from. So you know where to be devoting your marketing efforts. That can be challenging sometimes. But yeah, you know, just engaging with people on, on Instagram, I think is really important. I know that in the beginning, I was a little shy about doing it. Mm -hmm. Because again, I think when you're a new business, a new brand, you've got this kind of like, imposter syndrome thing going on where you're like, you know, so small, all these big brands out there, they look so legitimate and, and who am I? And, and you're kind of afraid to be putting any content out there. Um, you know, you're afraid of, of the scrutiny. You're afraid of, of maybe, you know, looking small or, or, or looking insignificant. Yeah. I know in the beginning I was, I was really worried about, you know, the, the brand voice being very professional and very buttoned up. And then at some point in time, I kind of took a step back and reevaluated that and said, well, the whole point of, of the Jules and Vetiver brand is that it's a reaction to the fact that, that the traditional perfume world is, is unapproachable and mm -hmm. stuffy and maybe a little bit uptight and, and closed off and opaque. And by just trying to, to imitate that and sound very highbrow and, and not be too silly or anything like that, um, it just, you know, how, how does that in any way jibe with, with what the, the mission statement yeah, for the company is? Yeah, how does is? it change the conversation? You know, exactly. How does it change the path? Yeah. Yeah, you know, it, it's, you have to be cognizant of the fact when you're a new brand that you can't be going out there trying to imitate what's already out there. Because what's the point? And you're not going to win. You know, it's, you know I, I hate to kind of like, it's not a David and Goliath story, but on some level it is. I think when you're a small yeah. brand, you shouldn't be pretending that you're some you know, large, large brand with, with, you know, 500 people working there and everything. Absolutely not. No. Personality is an asset. And so at some point yeah. in time, I, I think I kind of realized like, okay, well I kind of am the brand. And so I'm just going to be myself a little bit more. And sometimes yeah. I'm a little tongue in cheek and sometimes it's, you know, there's a little bit of a sense of humor there, but I think especially on social media, people don't want to feel like they're being advertised to people want no, to see they them. want to speak to the yeah. brand founder right they want to have that interaction with you and that's what's so great about instagram and with stories and what have you you can do that little bit of a peek behind the scenes as well yeah. um and sort of let people into your world a little bit and that is just you know i see that more and more with brands that are doing really well it's just that being real you know, and letting yeah. your personality shine through as well. So yeah, that would be a bit of advice to any, um, anyone really starting out and anyone who's founding a brand, you know, be prepared to kind of be yourself and be the face of your brand as well to an extent. Yeah. And, and you sort of need, I remind myself sometimes to look at it through even my own lens. Like mm -hmm. if I were looking at stuff on social media, I'm going to gravitate towards things that are funny or or interesting or useful in some way so just yeah you know like nothing but but product photos you know with 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 nothing interesting to yeah. say nothing nothing that makes me smile nothing that makes me think you know what's what's the point of that so i think over time you you get more comfortable with things and and you sort of realize like it is what it is this is my brand this is what we're about i'm confident that someone will like this so let me put it out there <laughs> And if not, then I'll just change it. Because again, when you're small, you can change anything. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that is the beauty of it. That's the beauty of being an indie brand. You can just, you know, okay, you know, not everything we, we think is a great idea lands well with the audience. So, you know, being able to change that and move direction is, is the beauty of being small, really. Yeah, definitely. Fabulous. Thank you so much, Katrina. It's been really lovely to talk to you. Um, and as I said, I will put your, the links to your pages below the video and, um, yeah. And for all of you watching, um, I hope this has inspired you to get out there and do that for yourself. And so, yeah, I've been Karen Gilbert and this is Katrina, um, Sellers from Jules and Vetiver and hope to speak to you again very, very soon. Bye for now, folks. <laughs>